It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. The Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. Jim Meehan, Richard Fox with you for another half hour of uh, all the news fit to print about Gonzaga basketball. Uh, one of the bigger weeks, regular season weeks, the Zags have had in a long time. Uh, played about as well as they could play for most of two games. Beat San Francisco, beat St. Mary's. And uh, Foxy, I guess the first topic is is all the uh, bubble talk. Are they in? Are they out? First four, last four, next four, last four buys, last four in. Uh, <laughs> that stuff, uh, I think the bubble burst in a, in a good way for the Zags over the weekend. What do you think? Yeah, all these amateurs out there that uh, do this for a living. Um Look, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And now when I mean, you look at what their net ranking is, um, I think it's just interesting how the conversation may be shifting from last four into are they uh, an eight seed? You know, <laughs> if, if they went out in uh, in the WCC tournament, I mean, are we talking them as a six seed maybe with a net in the low 20s or even upper teens? And now, you know, if you presume they're going to have at least one other quad one game in the tournament, what four quad one quad one wins two quad two wins um that's starting to look like a profile of a team that uh might be a you know mid single digits kind of uh seeding so yeah um, yeah it's it's been uh, they, they've been living on the edge but that Kentucky game I think uh, when you when you write the obituary of the season that's going to be the turning point for sure yeah that game flipped the whole uh flipped the resume around but I think kind of kind of changed their uh uh, how they were perceived nationally. Uh, you know, if they had gone in there and lost close, you know, people would have said, oh, that's, that's great and all, but that's sort of what you were expected to do. But they went in there and won a good game on the road, tough game on the road, and just kept building on that. And, and they have, uh, I think I wrote before the San, or the St. Mary's game that since they lost to Santa Clara, they, they've made kind of incremental, incremental improvements. And then after they lost to St. Mary's, I thought they made pretty stark improvement, pretty noticeable, decided improvement. And, and that's kind of played out. They're, they're playing very well now for extended periods, if not 40 minutes, you know, in that 30 minute range. So just a, a total turnaround after Kentucky. Uh, in the net, the Zags and St. Mary's, uh, I'm not sure why, probably had to do with other teams' games, but they flipped their spots. Uh, Gonzaga is now 16. St. Mary's is now 17. Uh, the AP poll has not come out, but I would imagine the Zags will move into the top 20. They were 23rd mm -hmm. last week. St. Mary's was 17. They'll probably drop uh, two or three spots. Who knows? But uh, we'll see when that comes out. And all the brackets that I've looked at, there is no longer any, you know, ifs or buts or maybe, or they have to do this. Uh, I saw the Zags as a seven in one bracket. Uh, they were an eight, I believe, playing Michigan State and Jerry Palms' latest bracket. Uh, they, you know, most of the time it's in the eight to nine range. One with a ten, I saw a ten uh, seed for them. So all those things take them out of Dayton. And uh, now, Foxy, it's it's uh, how greedy do you try to get? Do you want to be in the eight nine? In, you know, if you win that one, you've got to take on an Arizona, a Houston, a UConn, a Purdue. They've already played two of those teams. The 7 10 is a little different second round scenario. Uh, I don't know. If they want out, maybe there's an outside shot at a six. I, I still think seven is probably what they could get to. But either way, uh, it looks like they're dancing again. Uh, do you put much stock into that 8 9? Mm -hmm. Were you on the 8 9 that played Arizona? Uh, I was, second. yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, do you put much stock into the difference of, of the uh, uh, of the second round potential more more than the first? I mean, you're going to play somebody good anyway. It doesn't matter in the first round or the second. Yeah. No, this isn't the NBA playoffs where you're trying to maybe you know, drop a game late. I think you want to be playing your best basketball, and that's what this team is doing. 
um, and you want to keep that momentum behind them. You know, this is always an interesting time of year. Time of year, you've got the longest break coming up since probably Christmas, and yeah. then you get through Vegas, and you've got another long break. And when you've got a team like the Gonzaga right now, who's in a great rhythm, it has uh, a great feel for what they're doing. You know, I think every year we get a little, I get a little nervous about that. You know, it's not as if the conference tournament ends on the on selection Sunday or that Friday before. I mean, what have you done Tuesday now, or is it back to Monday? It's I can't remember. Tuesday yeah. Night, yeah. So, um, I mean, you might be off another 10 days after this stretch here coming up, which is going to be about the same. So, I think you just want to be playing your playing as well as you can be. You want to win. Um, you land where you land to your point. You're going to play a good team in the first round. Forget about yeah. just trying to think about the second round. So, um, I'd be pretty indifferent to that if I was Gonzaga. I certainly would rather not face a one if I could avoid it in, this, in the first weekend. But if you have to, to your point earlier, they've, they've played two of those already. So they're not going to be, I think, overwhelmed with the idea. Yeah. Gonzaga, Arizona. Hmm. That might be fun. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, but my, my mind started spinning like, what is the probability that Cougs and Gonzaga are in Spokane? I know it's low, but is it possible? And what would that do to this town? That would be something else. 7-10, first matchup, Gonzaga, WSU. How about that? That would, be, that would be amazing. The world would come to a stop in the Inland North last year. Uh, Foxy, let's move on. We got a uh, lot to talk about. Those two games, uh, as I mentioned, the Zags played uh, pretty – Pretty good basketball for for almost uh, I would say in the sixty five the minute range out of eighty possible. In that first game against San Francisco was kind of going along. Dons were playing well. Zags weren't scoring it great, and uh, you know they were trailing most of the half I think for more than seventeen minutes. When that game turned, I mean that thing flipped around completely. Uh, uh, you don't it see was, that very often. Yeah. <laughs> Remarkable. It was, they were down five, I think, late in the first half. Scored the last four of the first half. Open with, I think, 14 in a row. Give up the three, 11 more in a row. Um, I mean, they were up 29 before you could blink almost. Uh, you just don't see games turn like that, but I guess it shows you just how Gonzaga got rolling on offense and, and probably more importantly on defense. Uh, same story at St. Mary's. Um, but I thought uh, exceptional at both sides of the ball and, and took the heart out of San Francisco there with that run. I mean, the Dons kept playing, but uh, you could see that that game was decided. Uh, what, what did you see watching uh, Gonzaga yeah. go on that huge run? Well, you're right. It, it just felt like it, it happened in a blink of an eye. Uh, it reminds me, I think we talked earlier in the year about this team not having, not necessarily being able to put those spurts in, right. you know, like Gonzaga's teams in the past where yeah, those 50 they'd have runs, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and all of a sudden, yeah, you might win by 12 or 14, but you won it in those runs. And this team earlier in the year just couldn't put those together at all. Well, <laughs> they certainly put several runs together over a couple different nights this weekend. Um, I thought the last couple minutes of the first half were, were really important um, and not good for San Francisco. You know, I thought they they did a good job there in the first half. They didn't shoot it particularly well, but they made their threes. Gonzaga 0-4. Um, it felt like San Francisco had a good rhythm and, and was in that game. But you know, you, you you that's when San Francisco, if you can extend that to nine there at the end of the first half, and and kind of hold serve as it were. But you well go in the locker room. I think they're down one. Um, and then Gonzaga just came out. I mean, I, don't, I really don't know what else there is to say about it other than I, you just don't see that very often. That's a good San Francisco team. We've talked about that. Um, they've got real players. I mean, Mo Boo's a pro. I mean, you just watch him. He looks like an NBA player. Marcus Williams can go off on anybody in the conference. But for whatever reason, San Francisco has just really struggled against uh, St. Mary's and Gonzaga. We talked about it going into the game uh, you know, on the last pod going into the weekend. But, you know, on the season, they're averaging 83 against everybody else and just 67 against Gonzaga St. Mary's. Oh, wow. They shoot it under 30% from three versus 35% against um, the rest of the league. And more importantly, you know, they're basically flat, to, you know, 11 assists, 11 turnovers against those two teams. But against everybody else, they're getting about 18 assists and 10 turnovers. They just haven't been able to figure out a way 
to put 40 minutes together or even play well um, against the top two teams. And that, and that really showed itself. And, and that, we keep talking about this the approach of this team. Um, it's, it's hard to envision Gonzaga getting rattled. And they just can't – they've turned into one of those teams that just keeps coming. They just keep coming. They're just coming, coming, coming. They don't – They don't. it's hard to get them off their line. They're They're just going to play the way they want to play. And quite frankly, Graham E.K., um, you know, I don't know if he's going to be player of the year, but he's certainly been the best player in the conference this season. I mean, and you saw that over the weekend, but particularly against San Francisco in that second half. Yeah. Hey, I was just uh, on Twitter looking for the rankings. Uh, the AP rankings couldn't find those, but sounds like Pacific has uh, parted ways with Coach Leonard Perry. Uh, I've known Leonard a long time, covered him at the University of Idaho as a player and as the head coach, and I thought he's done a pretty good job there. I know they had a rough go this year; they were uh, winless in conference, but uh, his teams before that were pretty good. So, uh, coaching change coming in at Pacific going into the tournament, they play. The first game is that Thursday night, I think. So they'll have an interim coach down in Vegas. Uh, getting back to the uh, to the Don's game, uh, I thought uh, everybody will talk about Gonzaga's offense, and, and rightfully so, what they did at San, at San Fran and, and uh, at uh, St. Mary's. But defensively, I thought there was some real progress. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the guards from USF are good. Uh, Marcus Harris, Malik Thomas. Uh, Beasley, the kid off the bench, and they were going in early on. Uh, you remember Williams tore up the Zags in Spokane late, uh, kind of mm-hmm. got him back in that game with 16 points in the last couple minutes. He had nine points and five assists early on. Thomas was hitting threes all over. I think he had three for three from distance. He had 13 in the first half, but then that all changed in the second half. The Zags guarded Hickman, Nemhard, Anton, I think, guarded Thomas in the second half. Uh, and slowed him down, did all that with the ability to keep uh, Mobo from from going crazy. Second time, uh, he's kind of been uh, almost a non-factor offensively, which that's probably overstating it. I mean, he still passes. He's great on the offensive boards, but doesn't shoot it a ton a lot of times, doesn't dominate inside like he has against other folks. I thought the job that Zags did shutting down those guards put USF's offense at a standstill for a lot of that second half. Yeah, and that's an area where I thought this team could be elite. You know, you're always thinking, work. can you be top 10 in a category or two? Um, you know, typically you get to the final four and you're looking at teams that rank in the top 10, top 15, and you know, whether it be offensive, defensive efficiency, scoring, um, you know, defensive field goal percentage, whatever, you know, rebounding, whatever it might be. And that was the one area I thought this group, even though they don't, it's kind of intuitive in a way, they don't have a shot blocker in the traditional sense by, you know, at all. Um, but they've got the, the really smart. I think they're doing a good job with their rotations with Greg in the lineup. They're, they're enormous and long. He's really active. Watson's obviously a tremendous defender and EK is kind of sneaky tough. You know, you don't have to help with him. He's so strong outside of maybe Edie. I'm not sure there's anybody in, in the country that's going to you know, manhandle him or, or give him a give him a run with strength and size. Um, versus, you know, last year with Drew, Drew was not a good defender, and I think often would put them in a, in a tough spot. And they had to really, you know, work their defense around that that deficiency. They don't have to do that. I think they've got solid defenders on the floor. Even when you look at what Stromer can do coming in, I mean, he's back to kind of who he was early in the year. You know, opportunistic scoring the ball, but. Um, you know, more than capable defensively. And Huff's gotten better. I mean, you know, he's not nearly uh, the open door that he was even a month ago. But, yeah, I mean, look, you look at what they did over the weekend. I know we'll talk about St. Mary's, but they held the the other two best teams in the league under 63 points, under 39% from the field, and uh, only gave up, what, I think 14 free throws against San Francisco, maybe nine against St. Mary's, defended without fouling. And that's such a big part of it. This team's done a really good job with that. At this level, you just want to force contested shots or force yeah. guys to take shots they don't they don't want to take. You know, get them off their spot, so on and so forth. And I think this group's got a good feel for that. And um, you know, they've had some guys kind of go off, but generally speaking, they've they've been able to hold teams best, you know, the other team's best player and really make them have to work to try to get going offensively. And then with Mobu, I think one thing I would say is. 
that's a real head scratcher for me. You know, I presume he'll be back next year. That's something San Francisco is going to have to do is they got to get him to understand how good he is. Because if you look at his numbers against Gonzaga, they're, they're efficient. I mean, he was five. He had double-double, 14-11, five of nine from the field, yeah. three yeah. assists. I mean, you're looking at that, you're like, you'll take that all day. And then you watch a play, and you think to yourself, you've got to take 18 shots. You just have to be more assertive. And I, I would imagine that's the next evolution of, of where he's going to be as a player because he's a good one. But yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you, Jim. It's uh, the biggest weekend of the year, maybe the biggest road trip they've had in a long, long time. And I think they, they played about as well defensively as we could have wanted. Yeah. Now let's move on to St. Mary's. Packed house there at, uh, at well, it used to be McEwen Pavilion. Now it's University Credit Union Pavilion. I can't get used to these name changes, Foxy. Uh, <laughs> I just can't. I feel bad for McEwen, whoever it was. His name's no, or his or hers name is no longer on the court. So, uh, but anyway, uh, the Zags knew they were going into kind of a beehive there. Place was electric, loud. It always is. It's a great environment in there. The noise has nowhere to go, and uh, and they're right on top of you. And uh, the kind is a little bit like USF. They're trading punches a little bit. Zags got off to a much better start. Uh, you know, Gales were kind of doing their thing, keeping the score down. And then uh, I think it was 12 to 10 Gales and the Zags went on a 14 zip run. A minute or two passes, Zags go 7-0 run. And suddenly it's 19. And the Zags are up 19 in the first half over a team. And they're, you know, they score 44 in the first half against a team that gives up 58, second nationally in, in the country. Um, they, they turned them over. They got the running game going, which is rare <laughs> against St. Mary's, both of those things. St. Mary's takes care of the ball and they do get back on defense. They usually don't let you do that. Uh, and the story of the game was, uh, kind of the story of the, the last half of the, or most of the conference season, Ryan Nemhard and, and Graham EK were close to unguardable in that game. Uh, that's, probably too strong but they they totally I don't think dominated. so they totally <laughs> dominated so. that game I mean Ryan Nemhard is and I said this about his brother especially after that UCLA game uh, Andrew when it was one versus two it looked like he's playing a video game and he's just controlling all the different parts out there he's doing when he knows knows when to score when to uh, you know, go hard off the ball screen, when to go slow and let something develop, you know, when to kick it. To, so he just is, uh, he's in a, a group. Uh, I mean, his numbers are starting to be uh, single season type record numbers. And EK is, is, is scoring in such a high clip. I mean, when you get it, when he gets it in there, uh, you almost just expect it. it, it it's mm -hmm. either bucket or foul. Uh, like Kentucky, like USF, EK and, and Nemhard put on another show there at, at uh, St. Mary's. Yeah, I think if you had uh, if you had sat down with the staff before the first practice and you asked them, what's the best iteration of EK and Nemhard we saw it against St. Mary's? Um, just just Nemhard, to your point, the control he has, I mean, it really feels like the game has slowed down for him to the point where it's not all that hard. And I understand it is hard. He's working his butt off, playing 40 minutes and all that. But you can't rattle him. You can't speed him up. He plays exactly the way he wants to play. He uses the entire floor. He makes life so easy for everybody else. He's making shots. And then Graham, I mean, uh, I don't know how else to say this other than you lose the all-time leading scorer, who's a post player, and you don't think about him all that much the next year. That's because Graham E.K. has been that good. I mean, at, at what point this year have we talked about, boy, you really miss the interior scoring of Drew Timmy. I mean, we just haven't done that. Um, you know, we've had certainly players over the last few years where they've left and you and you feel you feel that void. They've been unable to really fill it in in the way that that you would have liked or or hoped that they could. Yeah. That's a real testament. That's not a knock on Drew. That's a real testament to what EK's done this year. And again, that Kentucky game is the demarcation line for this group. Not only was it a must win, and I don't care what anybody in that program says today, that was a must win down at Lexington. They found something down there. Um, and it not only changed the trajectory of their season, but I think changed that th their mentality. 
they, they, they were they were mature all year. I thought their approach was good all year, but there was something in their confidence that just wasn't there. And I think that game just kind of flipped the script for them. And you look at what you know what EK and Emhart have done since that game. I mean, <laughs> EK's numbers are historic. I mean, he's averaging tw- 23 points a game since Kentucky, tw- 23 points a game, eight rebounds, shooting 65% of the field. He's 27 of 30 from the free throw line. Yeah. And we're talking um, eight, nine games. We're not talking two games. Or four. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> the seven, this, this is seven games. He's got 10 yeah. blocks in those games. We talk about not having a shot block. He's got 10. And then Nemhard's numbers, I mean, they're just kind of dumb. 14 mm-hmm. points, uh, eight and a half assists, almost over five rebounds at, at his height to do that uh only two and a half turnovers shoots it better than 50 percent from the field and has nine steals in those seven games so he's getting back most of the most of the time most of the most of the turnovers he gives up he's getting back defensively so no I, it was uh those two guys were the difference i think quite frankly they've been the difference here down the stretch uh, everybody else has certainly filled played their part and done a really really good job and had moments but when you look at consistency night in and night out down the stretch here where they've had, you know, the Kentucky games a must win, Santa Clara at home, you got to get that game on the road in the Bay Area. You got to get you got to get two wins. Those two guys have been um, the horses that they've ridden. And I don't know. It's uh, it's really a remarkable arc of a season for both those kids if it you would know, start now's not the time necessarily to get into it but if you think about how it started and where they're at today it's a pretty impressive uh impressive arc yeah i, I was just gonna say there i mean nemhard has been so good i think he's in the player of the year conversation that's how good he's got <laughs> no I, I, I don't disagree i don't disagree yeah you know he might be second on that list we'll see we'll talk about that in a minute but Gales are really missing this Jefferson kid, Josh Jefferson, oh, yeah. who hurt his knee. Gave him great size, athletic kid, could block a shot, could guard, could score. I mean, he had a great game in Spokane, and he's out for the year uh, with the knee injury. Uh, without him, it was pretty much Saxon in there, and he's good. He's a very good post player. Uh, another guy who will come up in the player of the year discussion. Uh, he can guard one-on-one. He's pretty crafty in there, scores it, rebounds like crazy. But that's it. They don't really have a ton of depth in there. They have Forbes. They have a kid they bring in, Barrett, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, And so EK just kind of had a field day. Um, But one of the other things I wanted to mention on this game, then we'll move on. But, uh, you know, I thought there was some signs beyond Graham and and, uh, Ryan that were terrific for Gonzaga. Uh, uh, I'd ask you offhand if you knew, Nolan, how many assists? Did you think he had seven? Okay, you read the memo. Then you did. You you lied. You did. <laughs> I just knew. I got. I, 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 I think that is a season high. It, he, yes. He, it was like one of those games where you kind of watched and go, "Did no one do much?" Well, yeah, he did. He did some things, and people kind of no, overlooked zero him. zero turnovers. Yeah, seven assists. I think he had a couple of uh, buckets too that were well timed. Mm-hmm. Braden Huff barely played. I mean. But the rotation they had and how they were playing, he just didn't get much time. That's happened uh, a little bit the last couple of weeks. He came in. I think he had a steal. He had a block. He had a great bucket on a cut. And that pass from Hickman, a left-handed yeah. wraparound that hit him in stride, was as good as you'll see. Tell Nemhart hit the behind the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one. But uh, Greg was ter- Ben Greg was terrific. Hit the three, guarded all over the floor as always. I mean, I think he had 12 points. The Stromer, the restur- resurgence of Stromer continues. He has become a, a, a very important guy for him. I thought those were all big factors. Those guys weren't in the headlines, uh, but that's a great sign when your bench is, is doing what they did. And then like Nolan, kind of been scoring it like crazy, shooting it like crazy. Yeah. Didn't, didn't overthink it, didn't burp up shots, played within the offense and was more of a facilitator. Uh, those were great signs that night for Gonzaga. Yeah, look, the, the, the sign of a, of a great player is someone whose game or impact on a game is not dictated by their ability to score the ball. Even great scorers, uh, when they have an off night, if they're a great player, find something else to do on the floor, have, have, have a meaningful impact. And that's what you saw with Hickman. I mean, you, you, you just said it. He, he's been shooting the, the heck out of it. 
you know, going into the San Francisco, the previous six games, he was averaging 19 a game, yeah. feeling better than 52% from the field, 50% from three, and three assists. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's after coming off 22 points against San Francisco. Well, St. Mary's, he only takes seven shots, uh, four points, but his defense on Mahoney, Mahaney, was good, and the seven assists. So what I liked was he wasn't forcing up his offense. Yeah. If he was open, he took it. If he had something, he 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 explored it. But generally speaking, he just didn't force it at all, and he still brought value, and that's what you need because it's not you're not going to have it every night. You're not going to get opportunities every night. But can you do something else for us? And I think that's also been part of the growth of the freshman off the bench. And I, I've said it before, and I'll keep saying it. Um, they're going to go as far as their two freshmen can take them. In that they need something from them off the bench. Uh, and I think Stromer's really turned a corner. I mean, it was it was pretty bleak there for a long stretch here to start conference. Um, and it's hard as a young kid play on a high profile team. You get benched for a guy in Greg. How do you react to that? And I think he's finally figured it out. Last four games, he's playing over 20 minutes a game, averaging six points, four rebounds, shooting it well, four of eight from three, has only had four turnovers. Three of those coming, I think, in San Francisco. So when he's in the game, he's not hurting you with, with the ball. He's making open shots. And his defense, he's more active defensively than I think he was for a long stretch there. And part of being a young player, is, a good player, is understanding, well, if my offense isn't there, I can't let that snowball and impact everything else that I'm doing. And now he's a young kid who I think has grown up a little bit and understands I may not score tonight. I, might, I may not even get more than a shot. But I might play 15 minutes. What am I going to do if I'm not scoring? And that's that's been huge. I mean, you could you can envision putting Dusty into a game in the second round against them one seed in the country or number one seed in the tournament, and he'd be fine. I do not think either one of us would have felt that way four weeks ago. And then with Huff, you know, it's hard. He's playing against he's playing behind Graham E.K., who, if isn't the player of the year, is certainly going to be on the short list. And there's nothing about the way Graham's playing that would it is, and they've they've ramped Graham's minutes up here as they've gone down the stretch. You know, I think I, I looked at this the last seven games. He's averaging almost 30 a game early in the year. That number was 22, 23 in conference. Yeah. They've really ramped him up. So now, okay, that, that, that happens. You're playing against a really you're playing behind a really good player. What are you going to do when you come in the game? And he's had an impact. He's only playing seven minutes a game, last four games, but every game he's been in at minimum, he's not hurting the Zags. Yeah. Right. He's not a sieve defensively. He's understanding rotations, but the best version of him was St. Mary's. Hits a three in the corner, block, steal, good screen on for, for Hickman, dives to the rim, good catch, good finish. Those are A-plus minutes for him, has a real impact on them winning the game, but only played five or seven minutes. That's what you want off those guys. And I, so it feels like it's all rounding into form. And that move from Greg, and Greg to the starting lineup was a, a huge decision for that staff, and they got that one right. That was that was a that was a home run call by them to put him in the starting lineup, and now the two freshmen are playing, starting to look like like young sophomores. Put it that way. Sneak preview of of next Monday's show. We're going to go back through our first show of the year where we made all the predictions. One Richard Fox brought up the three big lineup in that show and the potential of it and how much they needed to use it, and that was the first show of the year. So. Uh, we're going to go every back. once in a while, every once in a while, I get them right, buddy. Every once no, in a while. no, those were, that was, uh, it was good stuff to listen to. We weren't, uh, we weren't as clueless as, as some might think on there. Our predictions are pretty good. I'll, I'll have so. to do that before next show. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, uh, uh, one other thing I would say the Zags, how they covered the ball screen action. They, yep. they doubled it, got the ball out of the hands a lot. Smart adjustment. I don't think they've done that too much with, with St. Mary's. Uh, but let's go ahead. The week, uh, coming is going to be, uh, kind of a rest recovery fine tune week practice week for the Zags don't play until Monday night. They will play most likely it's USF. They're the third seed. They only have to win one game in the quarters to advance. Uh, before that it's Portland LMU. They square off on Friday. I guess it would be that winner takes on USF. So that's the Zags assignment is teams they've beaten. Uh, they're six and zero oh against uh, beaten handily. Uh, most of the time, the the LMU game was close at, in the first half at, at uh, uh, in Los Angeles. The Zags pulled away. Uh, Portland, they've gotten after twice. 
and San Francisco, they, they beat the other night by 18, five in Spokane. So that's first round matchup. Um, we'll move right on to this. Cause I think this is going to be a good topic. And we'll go a minute or two uh, here with the different WCC awards, uh, yeah. which by the way, Graham EK was named player of the week this week. Uh, I'd be surprised if he's not named player of the year later this week. I think that's when the awards come out. Uh, he's just had a, a, an unbelievable run here in the conference. Um, really been effective most of the year. He's had some down games, but uh, you have to go back a ways to find him. Uh, money inside. I think the other guys that you might see come up for, for player of the year, uh, I, like I mentioned, I think Ryan Nemhard is, is, is made a pretty good case in his own right. I would have said before the weekend, last weekend, Anton Watson was in that picture even uh, as a possibility, but he just didn't have uh, his best week. I, I think it's between Graham E.K. And then the interesting one for me is who do the, who do the Gales put up for the award? Uh, you've got Mahaney's their leading scorer. Um, you know, shooting numbers aren't terrific, but, but uh, obviously can score it. Uh, I think he's at about 13.7 a game, 14.7 uh, in conference. You've got my, my opinion. It's between, for me, it's between Marshall Onis and Saxon as their nominee. And I might even go with Marshall Onis. His development was kind of that, uh, uh, what spurred them after that rough start. He really took over the point guard position, extended minutes, great defensively hit three balls, assists. I think he's over five assists a game in conference still and scored it 12 a game. He might be the guy I nominate. Saxon is very steady, very strong, good defender, both ends of the court. I think he's 11 points, mm -hmm. uh, maybe 12 points. And then, you know, right around seven or eight boards. I think that's the issue is, is if they had a standout guy with the numbers, they could probably match up with EK as being the conference champions. You'd probably get a little, headway on the award just from that. But I think what Graham's done when he did it here in the last stretch, what he did at Kentucky, probably getting them into the tournament. Uh, I think Graham's the favorite. And I think, um, you know, uh, I think Nemhard's right in there with whoever the Gales put up as, as their uh, uh, option for player of the year. What do you make of who, who do you think the Gales I mean, that's the question. So, is, is, is that, is that, remind everybody, is, is that how it works? This, the, the, the program puts up one player pro. I believe for that's how it works. I think they nominate one of their guys. Um, at least that's how it was in the old days, because there's been years the Zags had, you know, three guys averaging 13, 14 a game, and you got to put somebody up for that award. I think Pangos was one of those one year when he won it, was you know, had a balanced offense. And, and I think the Gales have that same thing going right now who do you put up if you had one uh, and does it matter do you think grandma's got that thing under a lock and key right now it might be well, a cold co situation like last year ek or um drew timmy and, and pajemski shared it remember so did, did, yeah i forgot about that it was yeah what was the other uh santa clara the, i think your ravio got it was also shared here um I think it's Marcelonis for St. Mary's that if, if you have to nominate one, which is to be fair, kind of stupid, um, you should just be able to vote for who you think on a, on a team is the best player. But it, it might um, be, I don't know, Foxy, but yeah. I think it's no, but that that, that 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 rings true to my ear. Um, but if I had to nominate one, I think it would be Marcelonis. I, you know, I, I think St. Mary's went through a little bit what Gonzaga went through with Hickman, which was you know they really they, he started out more as a point guard, and they've realized he's better off the ball. Um, but that experience, having been on the ball for as much as he was last year as a freshman, is helpful this year with Marcelonis, where they can they basically have two ball handlers that make, can make plays, just like Hickman, Hickman and Nemhard. And we saw that on Saturday night with with Hickman's seven assists. You know, there, there's real value in having to play that position for for a, a stretch. But um, I think it's EK. You just look at he's leading the, the conference in scoring, top ten um, in rebounding. I'm looking at it now. You know, tops in field goal percentage, um, top four in free throw percentage. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's it's hard to think of anybody else that's had as much of an impact um, on both ends. I mean, he's averaging a block a game in league two, and he's been a good defender. Um, but it's an interesting question. I mean, 
I've maintained all year, you know, as amazing as Graham has been, and you can't replace what he does. If, if, if in some alternative universe, he didn't transfer here, I think they would have found scoring inside or at least filled that void to some degree with Huff's ability to score. If you take Nemhard off this team, I don't think we're even, I, I, I think it's the USF and St. Mary's situation. I think Gonzaga really struggles personally. I think he's been the most important guy for them. So if I was nominating, I, I as counterintuitive as it might be, I think I probably would would nominate Ryan. But I think practically, or, uh, I think practically speaking, I think Graham is the player of the year. Yeah. yeah. Let's move on to uh, coach of the year. Um, I this this is interesting. This is like player of the year for me. I would have thought Mahaney after he scored twenty against the Zags up here and kind of spurred that win late too, helped him. I would have probably had him at the top of the list. Now I think I have him three for the Gales. Right. Uh, behind those other guys. Well, coach of the year. Uh, That's I easy. Think it was, yeah, I think it was pretty clear cut from the get go. Uh, you know, uh, what Randy did turning around that team after, I think they lost five games pretty early on. Uh, and how they stormed through the league until the last game. And then losing Jefferson, obviously, is, is key. I mean, I think Randy's a pretty heavy favorite there. Uh, I think a guy named Mark Few might have some consideration there. People might not think that way, but how they have gone from, let's say early, mid January, whatever to now uh, has been a, a pretty uh, remarkable coaching job. You, you have to give them credit for what they've done, how they've turned it around, how they've dealt with all the noise that's been out there. Uh, I'm part of that noise. I write, you know, every week about where they stand and mm -hmm. in the net and in the brackets and in the paper and all those things. I think he would, I think Lav, uh, Steve Lavin would have been in there, you know, a month ago, but they had a rough, rough finish. I think it's Randy's again. I think this is three in a row if he wins it this time. What do you think on coach? Yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's a good point about Mark. I mean, I, I, <laughs> We can think back and remember how bleak it felt after Santa, the Santa Clara loss. They just they hadn't played well in non-conference. They hadn't played. I think they played Pepperdine and in, in LMU up here, maybe, mm -hmm. um, and rolled the, rolled them. And then then you go on the road, second road game of the year, and you just cough it up. And it was it was there weren't good vibes, put it that way. Yeah. So the, the, this team has really stuck with it. I think that says a lot about them. I think he's. You know, you're you're grinding every year as a as a head coach, but some years are different, and I think this year was definitely one of those years where you've got it. You're coaching hard every week. Um, you, you know, this isn't a, a 2016 17 team or even the one with Suggs. I mean, this is a team that you've got to coach hard every week. So, um, I, I think the San Francisco, San Francisco coach. I don't know why his name is escaping me right now. Um, Chris Gerlison. Me, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I love what they've done this year. They just haven't beat any of the top the, the top two teams, so it, it's going to be Randy. It should be Randy. Um, he's a he's an exceptional coach. I mean, he just is. Um, you know, they 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 don't have the resources Gonzaga has. Um, you know, he, he he kind of always finds a way to. He's got good players, but he's not spin, not pros. But yeah. he has a way of just maximizing the guys he has and the way that they play and. Um, I'd, I'd be shocked if anybody else got that award. All right. We've got a few others to get to. We, we won't be as long winded the rest of the way. Hopefully maybe <laughs> we'll uh, no, no, uh, no promises. Yeah. The, uh, uh defensive player of the year, this is going to be a, 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 an interesting one too. I've got Anton in there. I've got Saxon from, uh, St. Mary's. I think Marshall Onis is a very good defender. I think the USF kid Mogbo or Mogbo mm -hmm. is, is a, a very good defender. Um, I'm going to go with with Anton. I, I think year uh, career work, uh, notwithstanding, even this year he is he's been very solid defensively. He gives them that ability to play the three big lineup because he can go guard a, a wing or even switch on the guards. Um, I, I again I. Saxon is very good down there, has been good there all year. Mobo is great stealing the ball, just like Anton. Blocks shots, very athletic, good defensive rebounder. Marshallonis at the guard line. I'm sure there's others. I'm going Anton. Uh, who are you going with? Yeah, I would go Anton as well. I think you listed all the guys that have a, have a chance for it. Yeah. Um, 
you know, Saxon's more of a traditional center, you know, block shots. Um, Mobu is probably his numbers are funny enough, just aren't up there, but you watch him play and particularly against other teams in the league and he's a problem, but I think it's Anton's uh, award. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, the poll just came out. Let me see if I can find what the Zags did here. Hold on. I'm shifting you. You're moving Foxy. No, you're fine, buddy. You're fine. Okay. Where is it? There they are. I'm picking this up and putting it down. Zags are 19. Washington State is 18. Okay. So that's where they are today in the latest poll. Let's move on to the sixth man of the year. Uh, uh, this can be interesting because I'm not sure how the, the, the number of starts you have to have versus coming off the bench, what that comparison is. Uh, Deuce Turner at San Diego. Uh, Benny Gregg it's, uh, with the Zags. Braden Huff with the Zags. Um, those guys are all in that picture. I think the Beasley kid at USF will get some consideration. Um, now, if, if Turner qualifies, he's got 11 starts. I think Benny might be up to 13 starts. So he's come off the bench more than he's started. Turner has the numbers, 15 and a half or 15.8 a game, hits a bunch of threes, uh, can really score it, instant offense. Uh, again, I think uh, being on winning teams carries weight in these awards, obviously. So if Benny qualifies, you know, he's around 9.6 rebounds rounded off. What he does beyond the numbers is, is almost incalculable. He is so impactful <laughs> every game. Uh, I would, I think the, the coaches might vote for Turner, but if I was voting on uh, my own vote, I think Ben Gregg, uh, would take home that award uh, if he qualifies. Who do you got? Well, I mean, I guess my question is, I mean, it's just league play that's under consideration, right? It's not a season award. Uh, I, th I think it's hard to kind of divorce the... Is it? You know, okay. Yeah, I, I think well, there is some merit to the whole season, but... Well, I think last year was easy. Malachi Smith got it, but he came off yeah. the bench every game. Um, yeah, that's an interesting... I, uh, when you when you threw that out there, and I did read to the bottom of the email and see that, thank you very much. Um, I literally was like, I don't, I don't know who you would go with. I thought of, I thought of Patton at San Diego, the freshman, but I think mm. he started subsequent, you know, last few, uh, for a while now. Um, but yes, it, I think if you're going to look at the, the entirety of the season, you can't ignore Turner's production, and you can't ignore. Greg's impact uh, on both ends, but I'll be in interested to see that because it's from a traditional, you know, Hey, during league play a guy coming off the bench. Um, I'm hard pressed to think of anybody that really would stand out in that category. Yeah. Uh, last one, newcomer. Now, this is always interesting because it, it can, includes transfers. It's not just freshmen. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a lot of transfers are going to be up for this award. Obviously EK and Nemhard for Gonzaga. Uh, I think Mobo has got to be right there as well. I mean, he's Correct. he's been fantastic. I think uh, the kid at Pepperdine, the freshman, Ajayi, uh, he's got great numbers. He'll be on that list. Ball from Santa Clara came from Arizona. He's had a nice season. Uh, I, I, this one, this is where you don't know if they if they give Ek the MVP, the Player of the mm -hmm. Year. Do they give this to somebody else? You know what I mean? They, they, do they try to? Uh, kind of make sure everybody gets an award or, or I don't know when they're talking about it, but you know, sometimes I think that does happen. They, they don't let one guy sweep <laughs> every award. Right. Um, you know, EK, I would say is the most impactful newcomer. I don't think there's any question. Nemhard is right there with him, just like the MVP race. Those two are on my list, probably one, two, uh, but I could see either Ryan or, or Mobo uh, getting that award. If EK gets player of the year. I guess it depends on, you know, if the coaches want to give it to one guy or if they wanted to shift it around to another. Uh, who do you like in that, in that scenario uh, for newcomer? Well, I agree with you. Uh, it's it, it should be either EK or Nemhard. I don't think anybody's had the impact those guys have had from a transfer perspective. Mobu would be maybe the one that I would look at and say um, – you know, th th that he could probably throw a wrench in that. I mean, they're finished yeah. third in the league. You're not giving it to uh, Ajayi 
uh, at Pepperdine, they were not very good this year. His numbers were great. He's a good player for sure. But, you know, I think part of these awards have to do with impact on yeah. winning. And obviously, yeah, they're just you, you can't the do that. In my, yeah, they're off yeah. the list. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think, I think we both agree EK's player of the year should be, um, if it's not a St. Mary's player. And then if it's uh, EK player of the year, I think it'll be damn hard, uh, newcomer of the year. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, uh, All that's right. our opinion. We, uh, we always give our opinions freely here. You can count on us for that. Uh, I think that's going to do it. We'll be back next Monday. Uh, like I said, we're going to go back through our preseason predictions and, and kind of see how we uh, we're going to put the grade card out there. See how we did. Uh, a plus. Yeah, a plus. We'll see. Probably a C is what we're going to end up with. Uh, but anyway, well, listen, we had a lot of fun today, all season. Of, of course, we enjoy coming every Monday. Uh, we appreciate everybody listening to the Zags Basketball Insiders podcast. Uh, we'll post this here in, in an hour or two. Our thanks to Christy Burns, as always, most importantly. Uh, and then uh, make sure you come back next Monday. We've got more to talk about. Thanks for joining us.